We're holding in Shar Yichud Ve'amuna, which is plunging us deep into the depths of how God's essence permeates every single thing in existence. And we explained yesterday from the verse, Le'olam Hashem Devarach HaNitzav B'Shamayim, that Hashem always, Devarcha, your words are holding up the heavens. So look inside. Perish of Shem Tov. Ki devarcha she'omris yehira kiya besoich ha'mayim. The very words that said, let there be a heaven. When Hashem said those words, tevis ve'oisius elu, those very words and letters, hein its voice, those very words are standing in the heavens. Hear this well. The letters themselves are inside the heavens. So to speak, like the heavens are the clothing around the letters. Okay? Just like I'm inside my clothing, yeah? And I'm inside my skin, and there's deeper parts of me in clothing, deeper parts of me, in clothing, deeper parts of me, right? Like layers of an onion. There's many, many layers. And by the way, one of the signs of more, let's call it, chashiv people is that they wear more clothing. They're showing that there's more layers. You know, like one of these things you'll see, like by a Rebbe Shachasana, you have like this little, you know, chasan. He's like some, you know, skinny you know, stick. But he looks like this big, because he has like the shirt, and then, and then the wolf, just mega vows wolf tzitzis, and then another shirt, and then another, and then another, and then the jacket, and the second jacket, and then the fourth jacket, and then the like linebacker, and he's like this big. Because the more Kedusha, the more special it is, the more there's layers. You ever bought a fancy piece of jewelry from somewhere? Bezrat Hashem, you'll all have wonderful wives, and you'll buy them fancy pieces of jewelry. Bezrat Hashem. I went to the place you suggested in Five Towns. It's right beside the... And when you buy the jewelry, in, did they just like give it to you in a, like a plastic bag? Or did they put it in a little box? And then put wrapping <coughs> around the box, and then another box, and then another bag. And then, no, no, you can't leave yet. And that goes into like another bag. And then that, that has more wrapping in there. And then it's like the final bag. And you walk out, you have like diamonds that are like this big in, you know, this huge bag. Because the more that something is special, the more that it has more and more layers of clothing, so to speak, okay? But what's at the core? What the Balatanya is teaching us is that the fabric of existence is the Hebrew letters. So did the matrix get it right? Almost, they went with ones and zeros, but it's really the Oiseus. The whole Torah is built on Hashem said, and Hashem said. Hashem is speaking. Those words are now becoming the, the core essence that all of creation is then forming from. Okay? And that's what the verse means. La'olam Hashem devarcha nitza b'shamayim. Forever your words, Hashem, are standing up the heavens. I.e., if you stopped speaking Heavens, heavens would just revert back to nothingness. The famous story of the Balatanya, at the end of his life, that he was, he was lying in bed, he was about to pass away, and he was with his grandson, Tzemach Tzedek, and he asked his grandson, he said, you know, what do you see when you look up to the, the ceiling? And his grandson said, I see the, the beams I see the beams of the, of, the, of, the, of the house, the ceiling beams, the rafters. And he said, you know, Zaidi, what do you see? And he said, I see the Hebrew letters, Kuf, Vav, 
Reish, hey, Koira means a beam. I see the letters beam being shined in and out of existence. I don't even see the ceiling beam anymore. I just see the Hebrew letters. It was like a Neo moment, Lahavdil. I just see, right, when Neo goes like, you know, crazy, and he just sees everything like that. So, Lahavdil. So the Balatanya is seeing the letters as the fabric. And so much of the world of quantum physics now is coming to that existence is information. Existence is information. The fabric of existence is more not there than it's there. It's more space than not space. And the deeper you go into it, it's information. And that's what we've been telling the world for thousands of years. It's built out of information, which is what's called Dvar Hashem, the words of God. And this is how Hashem is creating all of existence, every single second, is through speech. Now, I don't want you to think like, so what, like God is like, just like speaking in the sky? He's probably got some voice like, like Morgan Friedman, you know, like, whoa, like something like, wow. Obviously not. So we need to use an analogy of when we speak about God's speech, this is something that Tanya speaks about in the first Sefer of Tanya. What do we mean God speaks? So let's ask the Shiloh, what is speech in Lumdus? What is speech? So from our perspective, let's use our speech as an analogy. You know what speech is? Speech is, I have something inside of me that is only known to me. I have a universe inside of my mind and my thoughts that is secret. And that's why if you go on a date and the entire date you just sit there without saying anything, just looking deeply into the eyes of your date, eventually it just gets very awkward. Right? Like, say something. Probably get scared and run away. Yeah, yeah for sure. Like awkward was like maybe too soft of a, of, of a it was like run, you know. It's creepy. It's creepy. Creepy, it's definitely creepy. So and weird, for sure weird and creepy. Um, even though he's gonna say it back to his own defense, but what do you mean like like words like they are so limiting? We're just vibing. They're so the we're we're so deeply connected. I can't even pull it into words. <laughs> So, is he wrong? He's not wrong, but he's probably wrong for a first date, you know what I'm saying? Because when you, when you get to know, when you meet somebody, you want, you want them to know who you are. The way that we share and we express who we are is that inside of me there's a hidden universe. There's the world of my machshava, and even deeper than that is the different we're going to get to this levushim of my soul. There's deeper and deeper parts of my soul that become expressed through my machshava, through my thoughts. And my thoughts are, are between me and, and I. Me, myself, and I. But I don't want to keep them inside. I want to express me to you. I want to reveal who I am to you. I want to share who I am with you. The way that I do that is by using speech. I take what was hidden to you and was only known to me, and I reveal me to another. I reveal me to something beyond me, called my date, called your friend, called your chavrusa, called a parent. So speech in its essence is a way of sharing what's only known to me and opening me up to you. Okay? So far, so good. He's a Dvarm Shutam. So now let's take that to Hashem. When we talk about Hashem's speech, what we're referring to is that before God created, God knows Himself. There's only God. And God knows Himself. That He wanted, so to speak, to share Himself with another. So what's the medium? Whenever we talk about God speaking, by the way, this is all parts of Bereshit's Tyrus. You guys are getting Bereshit's Tyrus right now. 
They're like, what do you mean God speaks like Morgan Friedman? No, we should have come to Tanya. When God speaks, it means is that God wants to share himself with creation. That's us. The way in which God shares, so to speak, and creates at the same time is through speech. It's the process of, of creating is the process of Hashem, so to speak, spreading Himself to allow a different form of creation to develop. That's what speech is. That's why all of the creation is happening through speech. Because speech is the process of something which is just in me going outwards for another in the same way that we do with our speech. Okay? By the way, just that concept you could think about and like really take you to great places. Just meditating on that thought of all of God's speech. Whereas our speech though is different because our speech stops. There's my speech. There's me and my speech. You can record my speech. God in the, in the reality will be one with the speech. It doesn't leave him. You understand? So the analogy can never be the reality, otherwise we would be God. But we're not. We're, we're, we are an analogy of God. But the analogy pulls you into the reality of God's speech. You hear that? It takes us pretty close and it pulls you to a place where you can start meditating on how God's speech, when He's speaking, He's revealing, but at the same time it's staying within Hashem. It never leaves Hashem. Okay, We're going to get more into these concepts as we go, but we have to take it like you know, one step at a time. So the Balatanya, when he got to a level of consciousness of absolute unity, he just saw speech letters. All of creation was just in front of him. He saw the process of God speaking things into reality. To the point where he actually saw the letters. He didn't even see, this is a bit deep, he didn't see the clothing anymore. He just saw the essence. Which is very, without just being, saying too much, it's, being, it's, being very, it's a very intimate level. Right? The clothing is there for a reason, to block certain things. To create distance. The removal of clothing is... So the Balatanya was seeing the world without the levushim, without all of the separation. Yes, Daniel. If he sees the letters, does that mean he sees the clothing? The letters are enclosed in the ceiling beams, the stender. <coughs> but even the letters are clothing of the light of God that's inside the letters. Like multiple levels? Yes. The letters are more than just you know, ink. The letters are conceptual. The letters are pipelines of God's light. Yeah. So this is what we normally see, like I see a wall, that's kind of just like an interface? That's clothing. Yeah. Really, if you could see properly, you would see, conceptually with your mind's eye, to use your third eye for this stuff, you would see that, and you have to learn the Torah of it, that God is creating every single second, which makes sense because there's nothing but God. And therefore, if God is not creating, there wouldn't be a wall. Where we get fooled is we think that it's just a wall, nothing else, a bunch of drywall. Uh, God, if He's not willing that into existence, it's not here. So the Balatanya is going into a very mathematical uh, approach to give you literally the, 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 the outline of how is it here. It's here through God speaking it into existence. That's conceptual. There's no Morgan Freeman voice. It's conceptual speech, which means a revelation of God. How does he reveal himself? Through the 22 Hebrew letters. Yes? Um, does the, do these letters, are they affected by the way we write the letters? Because the way we've written the Hebrew alphabet over time has kind of changed. There's like the proto-Hebrew alphabet, and then we have like, we have, there's like print and script. Like, is that at all affected? The, the letters that we use in a Sefer Torah, that's, those are very essential letters. Those are the letters that we describe in the oral tradition. And we have very old Sefer Torahs like that. Very old. 
Okay? So now look inside. The Hebrew letters are in every part of creation and they are giving life to that part of creation. Which means that very nice pre-got mango drink on the table there. If it's mango. It's a mango? Oh, mango. So Hashem is speaking that into existence. Every single second, which means inside of that is Hebrew letters. That's the fabric of it. You now you have to train yourself because we just live in such a physical, like coarse existence. We're not sensitized <coughs> to spiritual things. That's why we're learning Tanya, to get us there. But the tzaddikim, they see the letters, they see these things. And they know that inside of this is just Hebrew letters. They know inside of everything is Hebrew letters. And that's why people who really get into Kabbalah, when you start realizing that everything's made out of Hebrew letters, and you start speaking out these Hebrew letters, you start realizing that you could move existence. You could shift existence. And that's what a lot of the miracle working of the tzaddikim is all about, is moving existence, shifting existence. Why do you think when we say Tehillim, you're creating different realities? The Tehillim are speaking existence. They're, they're fixing existence. Yeah. So like if, if everything in the world, like every single object and everything is, is created by Hashem, is like, like Dabar Hashem, doesn't everything have an inherent Kedusha to it? Like, yeah. So how do you like, how do you like destroy or like, like, like if, Jews are very careful. They have to be very, very careful with just destroying something uh, without purpose. The Torah will guide you how to use everything. The Torah is always going to be the guide. If a person's walking down the street, can you just rip a leaf off the tree? Ha <laughs> ha, watch this. Why'd you do that? Because I can. There's Devar Hashem in that thing. Step on a bug. What are you doing? Just like, ha ha. The Arizal was careful not to kill bugs. I don't know if his, what his wife thought about that. I don't know. I don't know. But then, that's all. If your wife tells you that it's, she's scared of it, then there Hashem is telling you, you, you should kill it. Uh, no, you have, to, you, have to do, you, have, you have to do everything in a, in, in a measured... How do you humanely kill a bug? Pardon? How do you humanely kill a bug? I'm saying, like, you don't just go crazy with them. Like, I, my wife is very scared of this cockroach or something. She's on a chair, let's say. So, okay. I need to defend my wife. She's very afraid. If you could maybe get out of the house, that's one thing. Also, there's, there's a fly, a mosquito, like, shoo it out. You don't need to be, we are not violent people. We're Rahman and Baishanam and Goim Lecha Sodom. You have to be very, you have to sensitize yourself that I don't want to do anything which is, which is uh, senseless, baseless. Very, very important. Because everything exactly for that point has Dvar Hashem in it. You have to know, how is the Torah telling me to approach that thing? The Torah will guide you how to deal with everything. But that's always a very bad sign if somebody, sadly, like some of kids, like they, they'll step on cats or something, like throw rocks at pigeons. That's horrible. That's what, why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? When I grew up, I used to uh, tree plant. I spent a couple of my summers tree planting. Tree planting like in the, in the west of Canada, in uh, British Columbia. Now, tree planting sounds like a very lovely thing to do, but it was oftentimes actually very sad because you would go and you would see, you'd go into a mountain, it looks very nice, you'd turn a corner on one of these logger roads, and as far as the eye can see, it was just barren mountains. It's called clear cutting. It's just take every single tree away and try to bring in some tree planters and hopefully it's going to grow back, but it never really grows back so well. And you have, you know, why don't we slow things down? Um, are we just supposed to just cut every single tree in sight? Well, of course, why not? Biggest profits. But wait a second. 
Hashem gave us two mitzvahs when we came to the Garden of Eden. You know what those two mitzvahs were? Two mitzvahs. Oh, give names to the animals? Two mitzvahs. Don't, don't eat the tree. L'shamra avda. Come into the garden to guard the garden and to work the garden. Say the Sfarim, Chazal say, to guard the garden had included in it all the 365 don't do mitzvahs. And to work the garden had included in it all the 248 positive commandments. Those were the two mitzvahs. Guard the garden. Don't destroy this garden. The Mesil Sisharim brings us in the beginning of Mesil Sisharim. Guard the garden. You can't just destroy this garden. You can't destroy things for no reason. There's a purpose, that's different. You can't just destroy, you can't be a destructive person and work the garden though. But don't think, I can never use anything from this world. I, can, I might have to keep the same plastic cup for like 40 years. I can never use a second plastic cup. No, you're allowed to. The world is here for us to use. But you can't be wasteful. It has to have purpose. And Hashem will ask you, was there purpose in that? Was there purpose in it? If they know, is there purpose in it? If there's purpose, then Hashem says, the whole world is here for you to use. I gave you this world. You can use this world. You, have, you can't be too extreme on either side. You can't say, the whole world is here. I'm going to cut every tree down ever. Wait a second. Is there a calculation here? Is that okay? We have, let's talk about it. But at the same time, I'm not cutting any tree down. Ever. You're allowed to. When I was in Thunder Bay, Ontario, so I had the privilege of meeting a lot of native cultures and a lot of native people who lived on the land. And I met a lot of the elders. I would hang out with the elders because I found that oftentimes the elders had a certain perspective of life that was just like on point. And I remember at one point, I was speaking to them about logging and about sustainability. And they said, yeah, when we go into the forest, we also harvest trees. You know, we make canoes. We, make, we need, you know, I didn't say stenders, but like we need, we need the tables and stuff. And, but what we do is we do something called sustainable harvesting. We go into the forest. We see where two trees are growing together. And one tree is going to choke the other tree out. And they're both going to die. So we go, we harvest that tree, which means we get a tree. And we also make the other one grow strong. So after a hundred years, our forests are stronger. They're more vibrant. And we got tons of trees. Because you know what we think about when we go into the forest? We don't just think of one or two generations. I remember when he told me this. He said, we think about a thousand generations. I was like, I hear that. In Torah we say, Nikarim divrei anet. Something, when you hear something true, it rings with authenticity. And I remember coming to yeshiva, and I remember learning the Gemara, that somebody was seen and he was planting a carob tree. And somebody came over to him and said, what are you planting this carob tree for? You know, it takes 70 years for it to grow and bear fruits. You're never going to eat these carobs. I said, yeah, you know, but I, like, I'm planting for my kids. That they should have carobs. And you know the carobs that you and I are eating? We're only eating them because our ancestors planted, planted care before, before us. I remember thinking, like, that's what, the, that's what that native man was telling me. Are, are, you, are you seeing the big picture? The Shamra Ula Avda. The Jewish message is, the world is here for us to use, but not abuse. How are you going to figure that out? We have a Torah. It's going to give you the balance to tell you. So everything is made of the letters. Everything. Okay, let's just see a couple lines now. Kedichsiv, and we have psukim like this. The posuk in Yeshayahu and Isaiah, Memches. Udvar lakim yokum la'oilam v'dvar of chayim v'kayom la'ad. And the word of Hashem, yokim, is, is standing up forever. V'dvar of, and Hashem, your words, Chaim v'kayim lo'ad, are forever. Meaning your words are standing up the existence. Without your constant words, which means your consciousness, 
you're opening yourself from just being only you, Hashem, and allowing for creation, you're, you're sharing with us, the creation, through your creation. And by the way, when God speaks, the manifestation is immediate, right? There's no time delay. When we speak, there's a time delay. Words create reality, right? You heard this, right? Abracadabra. It's like what you know the magic guys do? I'll pull a bunny out of my hat. Abracadabra. So, it's a Hebrew word. What's well, sort of a put formulation. Abara, I will create kedabara, according to what I say. The creation will come according to the speech. But for us, there's sometimes a delay in that process. Whereas for Hashem, it's immediate. As soon as Hashem is speaking, it's creating. It's happening, immediate manifestation. When Mashiach comes, our speech and manifestation is going to be immediate again. Even more, it's going to be your thoughts. You're going to immediately manifest according to your thoughts. Which means, by the way, be careful what you're thinking about. Like, oh, whoa, dude! Now I see what's been going on in there. At least your speech, you can block it a bit. But your thoughts, like... Right? Last line. Because if for one second, Chas V'Shalom Hashem would take away the letters. Karega! for a second, the chayzreis lemakoyren, and the letters would go back to the makor, which means in Hashem. Hayukol hashamayim, ein ve'efes mamish, all of the heavens would become nothingness again. Vahayukoloi, hayuklal, it would be like nothing. Maybe this is also, but like Yankov said, it would be like nothing. And would you have a memory of it? It would be like before creation. Or would it be different, it would be a residue, like we mentioned yesterday. The kamay koydam maim or it would be as if before God ever said, let there be a heaven. Well, what would it look like in heaven before there was a heaven? No, there wasn't. It, like that. Heaven would be back in Hashem. Mamish. All of the creations above and below. Even this world. Physical things. No, what do you mean? Maybe like spiritual things would go back to nothingness, but like this tender, it's here to stay. Uh, not if God removes his consciousness from it. Everything is filled with God consciousness. We're going to go deeper into this tomorrow. Have a wonderful day of learning, and our learning should be in the merit of bringing peace and blessing to the world. Amen.